Our marine environment is in crisis. Long Island, nationally known for its fisheries and its recreational waters, is a clear illustration of the situation. In 1985, brown tide hit Long Island and ruined its famous scallops fishery. Brown tide has remained. Indeed, through most of last year, Great South Bay and Mauritius Bay stayed coffee brown. And now there's red tide, toxic to people. Meanwhile, there are what are called endocrine disruptors playing havoc with the sex of fish. And then there's acidification caused by global warming seriously disrupting marine life. Dr. Christopher Gobler of the Marine Sciences Research Center at Stony Brook University. We all know about brown tide and we all know the effects that it's had uh, responsible for essentially bringing an end to the scallop fishery and likely having a big impact on our hard clam uh, fishery in the South Shore and leading to the loss of a lot of eelgrass as well due to light attenuation. Uh, 2008 was remarkable in that we had a bloom start much earlier than previous years in April. It started in western uh, Southwestern Bay, Western Great South Bay and spread throughout Great South Bay. We also had a bloom on the eastern part of Long Island that spread into Shinnecock and Mauritius Bays to the point where by June of last year, the entire South Shore is blanketed with brown tide, uh, with the exception of our inlets. So there's 100 kilometers of our South Shore bays. We reach densities we've never seen before in the South Shore, 2 million cells per milliliter. And the bloom really never went away. That is, even into December, and when we had ice over in Great South Bay, there were still levels of brown tide that are detrimental to shellfish uh, at over 50,000 cells per milliliter. And, um, that made some news in Newsday last year. Um, it caught the attention of Chuck Schumer, who contacted me, uh, and together we worked on writing a letter to the U.S. Department of Commerce in an effort to declare a fisheries disaster in Great South Bay for the hard claims. Uh, that, that letter has now been pushed on to the new Commerce Secretary, and that effort is still ongoing uh, because of the recurrent brown tides and the impact that it's had on the hard claim fishery there. And, of course, Newsday was very interested to hear about that. Uh, regarding brown tides, in, uh, in the next generation of research that we're doing now, looking at the causes, uh, we've been looking at the genome of this organism to try to understand what makes it tick at a molecular level. Uh, we have a poster tonight by Elise Walker that's talking about the blooms in general, but she also has some information on sort of the uh, genomic approaches we're taking with regards to these blooms. Dr. Gobler, the issue of red tide kind of mm -hmm ups the ante. First it was brown tide, now red tide, and red tide can be a, a health threat. It can be. The particular species that we're talking about is known as Alexandrium. Uh, it's common in many places in New England, particularly Maine and Massachusetts. Um, we knew cells were here of this algae, but we always assumed they were at low levels. Uh, in 2008, there was an event in Northport, New York, where the, shelf, the densities of these red tide cells got very high, the shellfish got very toxic, and a shellfish bed had to get closed down. At the same time, we were looking throughout the south shore and the east end of Long Island, and we found fairly high levels of the cells at different places and times. Uh, indicating that there's the potential for future shellfish toxicity events uh, in those locations. Now, future shellfish toxicity events, in other words, you're talking about poison in shellfish that can affect people. There's the potential. Now, it's certain places and times, and I will also say that the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, their marine division, has a very rigorous monitoring program for looking at toxicity within shellfish to protect against human health. And with the information we've been able to generate, I communicate with them very frequently, and they've been expanding their monitoring to ensure that shellfish that's being eaten by humans on Long Island is uh, not a health threat. Now, this is new. I mean, the brown tide killed, uh, well, it wiped out the Peconic Bay scallop. It uh, suffocated, in effect, the eelgrass. Mm -hmm. It just wrecked havoc with the ecology of eastern Long Island's bay system. But it was, um, well, in many ways, an aesthetic problem. It caused the water to become brown mm -hmm. and uh, devastated uh, marine life. But we're talking now, your newest findings, about a, uh, um, an organism that could impact on people. That's right. And um, I, I should point out that there's actually, uh, believe it or not, 
two types of red tide on Long Island. Um, one that's like the brown tide in that it discolors the water, affects the ecosystem, but doesn't affect human health. And then the other one, this Alexandrian one, you're absolutely right, it does make a toxin that can affect humans and can make people sick. It's kind of scary. I mean, you're a scientist and you're not supposed to uh, oh, delve into issues of people becoming scared, but I mean, red tide is toxic. We're here on an island. People want to enjoy the water. And what you're saying is that there is now something in the water, and it could be growing or it could not be growing, that could impact on people. But I, I'll emphasize that um, it's uh, at, at certain times and places. For instance, we know for a fact that when the, the, when the cells are in the water, it's typically only in the late spring. So actually right now, April through May, and we know that they disappear thereafter, and we know they're not around in the winter. So, you know, thankfully, the research we've been doing here at uh, Stony Brook, Southampton, has identified when it occurs, and now we're trying to narrow down exactly where, and we have located some of the precise locations, and we're, in, we're passing that information on to the New York DEC, uh, and thankfully, some of those locations are places that already have closed shellfish beds. So, but again, um, this isn't to scare people, it's just to recognize that it's out there. Uh, and thankfully, I think we're way ahead of the situation. We know it's out there and we're uh, now refining precisely what the threat is. And I can say that I'm confident uh, that because of the work we're doing and communicating with the DEC, that uh, there is not a health risk to people with regards to shellfish right now. This was the headline. I superimposed this picture. That was not the picture. <laughs> uh, in my world, maybe that's the picture. That's the picture. But, um, there's actually some worse headline than that, uh, so I put that in place of it. But uh, this species, Alexander fundiens, causes red tides historically in Maine and Massachusetts. Uh, it's uh, unlike brown tides, which are just harmful to the environment. This species makes a toxin that can make humans sick. And uh, it had thought we knew it was around in New York. We didn't think uh, that it was causing any toxic events. Uh, but what we found last year in on. Uh, North Shore of Long Island and Northport was a tremendously large bloom of this species, over a million cells per liter, uh, and we found toxic shellfish. We worked with the New York State DEC on this, uh, reporting our results. They were putting out shellfish to look at toxicity, and in fact, they found very high levels of toxicity. Uh, the threshold for uh, closing a shellfish bed is 0 .00, 0 .08, uh milligrams per liter. So we were approaching two orders of magnitude above that, uh, enough to close this entire shellfish bed, 7,200 acres, uh, for an extended period. And again, this was something that made the news. What are endocrine disruptors and how do they affect the sex of fish? Dr. David Conover, Dean and Director of the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University. The research that you folks have been doing on endocrine disruptors is it's, it's scary, frankly. It is. it is, yes, because what it shows is that even small quantities of hormones uh, can, in the water column that are effluents in sewage treatment can do things like change the gender that fish uh, uh, express in the wild. And that's what you've been finding, that from, from Manhattan out to uh, the end of Long Island, the eastern end of Long Island, there is all kind of impacts by these endocrine disruptors on the the gender identity of, of marine life. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, we have scientists such as Ann McElroy, who has looked at, for instance, uh, winter flounder uh, between winter, uh, New York Harbor and out in the East End. If you look at the ones close to New York City where there's lots of sewage treatment, they're almost all female. And then as you get farther out, they become more male. And there's other species where we see those same patterns. How does that happen? Well, it's because there are uh, hormones that are related to the things that, uh, frankly, that women take to inhibit uh, for birth control uh, that actually have a feminizing effect on fish in the wild. And these things get through sewer systems into that's, the water? Uh, that's right. It only takes actually a very uh, low concentration to actually have these influences. And it's not just a matter of, uh, of influencing what sex, ratio, what sex fish become, but also it can be more disruptive as well to their reproductive capacity. I would think that if you have large percentage of males here and then large percentage of females there and no kind of mix between the two, these 
fish populations are going to collapse, no? Well, it, that's, um, well, perhaps. One thing we know about winter flounder is they're very localized in their population. So the ones way out in the East End and the ones in New York Harbor probably don't mix with each other that much. So it's not as though you can produce all females at one end of Long Island and all males at the other and expect that they're all going to mix when it comes time for breeding. Well, that's exactly what I mean, but yes. you're not going to have much reproduction if everybody is male and then here everybody's female, correct? Uh, that's right. Yeah, it's, it's, it could easily re reduce the what we call the reproductive capacity of a population. What's to be done? Uh, well, we need to remove some of those, uh, uh, those hormones from the uh, water that's in the sewage effluent, which is not easy. Is it more than just uh, pills perhaps women take for birth control? I mean, there's all sorts of uh, endocrine disruptors in plastics going into, uh, into the environment. Uh, that's right. And uh, now, on that, in, uh, in terms of what substances besides... Uh, uh, things like birth control pills contribute to that. I, I'm not the expert on that. Uh, but uh, yes, it is true that other substances also contribute to that. And then there's acidification caused by global warming. Stephanie Talmadge from a family that goes back to the earliest European settlement of Long Island and a graduate student at the School of Marine and Atmospheric Sciences at Stony Brook University. Studies have shown that coccolithophores that use calcium carbonate have actually decreased and had malformations in their hard parts with increasing CO2, as well as reef building corals throughout the world have been on decline, partly because of this increased ocean acidification. Even pteropods have shown to have malformations in their hard parts with those increased CO2 levels. Some work has even been done on the adult and juvenile stages of shellfish, showing that decreases in calcification for adult mussels and oysters at CO2 levels of 740 parts per million have occurred. Now, 740 is a part per million is something that's projected to occur within this century. And um, Green et al. has shown an increased juvenile heart plan mortality at levels undersaturated with respect to calcium carbonate and functional. And then as we start to increase the levels of CO2, it appears to start to degrade, where at the highest CO2 levels, it's fully degraded in the center, and we question whether this is functional at all. And this could be a reason we're seeing those declines in survivorship. They may not be able to obtain food or excrete wastes. So clearly I've shown you that ocean acidification has an adverse effect on larval shellfish. And it's possible that marine coastal zones are already experiencing high CO2. Um, terrestrial carbon results in a net heterotrophic estuary system. And in Shinnecock Bay, we measured uh, in the summer of 2007, estimated CO2 values between 400 and 1,200 parts per million of CO2. That's exactly in the range of the results I'm showing you today. And River discharge and upwelling can also locally increase CO2 levels. So therefore, these shellfish may already be experiencing these high CO2 levels. So in conclusion, concentrations of CO2 expected to occur this century in ocean waters and occurring presently in estuaries yield significantly increased mortality in the larvae of ecologically and economically important shellfish. And there are secondary negative impacts on metamorphosis, size, as well as shell thickness and integrity will all cause additional mortality beyond just these effects observed during the larval stages. And these direct and indirect impacts of elevated CO2 on the larval survival are likely to escalate into the entire adult population. Ms. Talmadge, beyond everything else, now your research indicates that carbon dioxide can impact uh, rather seriously on marine life. Yes, um, that's, that's very true. What I'm studying is something called ocean acidification, and this is how, as we increase um, the amount of fossil fuels in our atmosphere, how that's directly entering the world's oceans and adversely affecting things that form calcium carbonate shells, such as shellfish. You estimated out to 2250. I mean, it's a long time from now. Yeah. But you calculated the impacts of uh, that carbon load on uh, on marine life in 2250.
2250, what would it be? Um, well, in year 2250, we would expect carbon dioxide levels to raise from today 400 parts per million, close to 1,500 parts per million of CO2. And that has shown to greatly decrease the survivorship of larval shellfish, bay scallops, hard clams, and the eastern oyster. Your research also indicates that the amount of, uh, of a carbon load that's uh, hitting marine life now has its effect. That's very true. Um, locally, Shinnecock Bay can already have very high level, and other estuaries throughout the eastern end of and Long Island in general can have locally high CO2 levels already. So it's very likely that the large number of declines in the landing of shellfish that have normally been attributed to other things, such as brown tide, um, could also be affected by this ocean acidification. Now, when people think of uh, carbon emissions, they think of global warming. What your research sort of concludes that it's not just global warming, it's uh it's marine life. That's true, and um, it, it's actually this, this ocean acidification occurs simultaneously as oceans are increasing in temperature, which we know can have adverse effects. So those combined is what we're, we're talking about, that climate change encompasses all these things. The consequences, if something is not done, about these carbon emissions would be what to marine life? Well, it could be as, as terrible as numbers of shellfish being so low that the adult natural populations have a hard time reproducing. We hope it doesn't get to that level. Um, in every township, we're doing as much as we can to keep our restoration efforts and our aquaculture restocking these natural local populations to keep them sustained. Larry Penny, Director of Natural Resources for the town of East Hampton, and a Long Island native is sad about the situation. Larry, you recently wrote a column in the East Hampton Star speaking about all that would be left in terms of boats on the water will be freighters and tankers, tankers and sailboats. There'll be no fishing boats left. Why? If, if we keep up the way we're going, we're going to drive the fishermen out of business. You know, it's, you, nobody realizes except a few of us that if you go out and catch like a thousand pounds over your quota of something, you can't bring that in. It's flopping around, half dead already, you throw it back in the water. So in a sense, every time they go out and they get more than their quota, they have to throw the stuff. Sometimes it's much more than what they're allowed to keep, throw it back in the water and it dies. And you know, we got the poison of the waters, we got uh, all sorts of stuff going into the waters. We have uh, these regulators are like, uh, enhanced bureaucrats like, uh, you know, the Tsar, the Tsar Russia when you had 19 levels of bureaucrats and they, they lose the uh, passion for what they're regulating and regulation becomes their passion and, and there's such a lag time between getting by the regulators and improving conditions. Uh, it's gonna, it's, 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 the fish stock is not only dwindling but it, but we got all these things like seals and cormorants eating the fish uh, that fishermen should be catching, you know? So it's a, it's a very tough life, a price of fuel and all that kind of stuff, so. I mean, essentially you were drawing the picture in that column of when you look out at the, at the water, yeah. and we're here on Long Island and there's plenty of water to look yeah. out at, and it will be in effect a desert, I mean, yeah. I mean, some right. people would say that's extreme, no? Well, I, y y you can't just go out for nothing if you're a fisherman. You have to catch some fish and sell the fish to pay for the fuel and pay for the boat, and a lot of them owe a lot of money. Uh, so there'll be a few recreational fishermen around, but mostly uh, the fish will be eaten up by cormorants and, and striped bass and uh, seals and uh, uh, other things, whales, uh, you know. Uh, there won't be much left over for the fishermen, actually, you know. What's to be done about it, and is there anybody kind of doing the right thing? Well, I would like to see some stock enhancement, which is done on the West Coast, and which Japan does, and which Norway does, and Sweden does, where they actually raise fish, native fish, fish that would normally be in those waters, and they release them to uh, make up for the loss of, of a stock that is beaten down by this and that process. And we'd like to start with Western Flounder, and we're running into a terrific uh, uh, bureaucratic uh, uh, blockade, as it were. And we, but 
which we think will be persistent. We start with winter flounders and build the stock up, and, uh, and then we'll try to go to blowfish. They're practically disappeared, you know. Uh, I'd like to see the regulators uh, uh, remove some of the cormorants, you know, and, and, and maybe even some of the seals. Uh, everything is uh, sacrosanct, but so is the fishermen and the, <laughs> and the fishing. Eelgrass is oh, it's at the foundation of, uh, well, certainly the, the, the bay scallop, which is uh, all but vanished. Uh, it's been, well, since 1985, since right. the first yeah. brown tide hit, and the eelgrass, because the brown tide just blocked the sun, right. disappeared. Yeah. Uh, it's been that way. Do, do, do you yeah. see you know anything? You know? Well, you know, we found out recently, and we think we have an answer for some eelgrass problems. We stopped dredging inlets uh, because we ran out of money and because there just wasn't the, uh, the drive by Suffolk County, the Public Works and Department, and the money was going to other places and the local communities didn't have dredges and the people, the, the private contractors that have dredges dwindled down to a few and the, all the inlets clogged up. There's not enough fresh water coming in out of the bays, you know, and so the eelgrass uh, is, in a sense, is being starved because of the particles of, of silt in the water from, from motor boating, for example, and also the fact that it's not getting the cooler water from the bays. So as soon as we opened up, say, Napig Harbor a few years ago, after an inlet had filled in completely, the eelgrass charged back. So we think that uh, Periodic maintenance dredging is very important, and that was uh, the theme of an uh, of a, of a earlier talk today that was given by the TNC uh, down in um, Cold Spring Harbor, you know, periodic dredging. What about planting well, eelgrass? Well, planting is a possibility, too. You have to have the right conditions, and we, there have been very few successful plants. A lot of us have tried to plant it. We just haven't develop the right knack, although Chris Pickerel and the Cornell Cooperative Extension have been successful in a few places like Fishers Island, but where you have good water, where you have good water coming in and out, uh, that's where you have the most success, uh, you know, planting eelgrass. What's to be done? Peconic Bay Keeper, Kevin McAllister. Kevin, it's 2009, and in terms of the marine environment, things have gotten, if anything, worse. Now we're not talking just about brown tide, now it's red tide, which is, which is a poison to people being found out there in the waters. Uh, there's been uh, the impacts of endocrine disruptors that's been found. I mean, the sex of fish have changed because of these, uh, uh, these toxic substances being sent into our waters. Uh, fish populations have been going down. And I mean, how do you see it these days? Our bays are under siege. Um, in winter flounder, it's a virtual collapse. We've either overfished the, the stock or we've polluted our waters where they can't uh, reproduce to sustainable levels. Uh, you mentioned endocrine uh, disruptors. You know, the pharmaceuticals that are moving into our waterways from septic systems. You know, our cesspools with both nitrogen and some of these other components, it's enormous threat to water quality and obviously to the, you know, the health of our bays. Uh, you mentioned red tide. You know, that's appeared in the Peconics and Shinnecock Bay for the last several years. Uh, releases a biotoxin that threatens, obviously, finfish, uh, shellfish, and human health as well. Um, a couple of years ago in Flanders Bay, there was a, a massive soft clam die-off of juveniles. You know, it was a, a foot thick in uh, shell hash on one of the shore, you know, shorelines, uh, several shorelines. And it wasn't until probably a couple of months later that I learned there was a, a red tide out, outbreak that I believe attributed to the die-off of, uh, of obviously this, the shellfish. Uh, we've seen the two highest density, highest levels of brown tide in uh, Great South, Mariches, and Shinnecock Bay uh, over the past two years. Uh, it's really returned with a vengeance. As baykeeper, your, your principal job is to try to get government to, to do something. Has government, uh, in general, done much? There are, um, there is progress on several fronts, but we haven't been done, we're not doing enough. 
And I think my principal role is really to try to rally people because ultimately the people are going to affect you know, the positive change that's incumbent upon our, our elected officials. They've got to tune in. Uh, we released a report in December, Baywatch uh, 2009. Um, you know, it's based on scientific data. Uh, it doesn't paint a pretty picture. And this was provided to every elected official or most, most of the elected officials on Long Island. We want their attention and we want action. It's going to take enormous investment of, uh, you know, monetary resources. But you know, what price do you pay a place on a, a healthy bay, or for that matter, a, a dead bay? What needs to be done in your view? Well, in particular, we've got to tackle stormwater runoff. That's the single greatest threat to our, uh, waters of the United States. All the drainage off the uplands, roadways, parking lots, uh, yards, you know, um, all the chemicals, fertilizers, uh, pesticides, sediments. Uh, animal waste, uh, I mean, the list goes on, petroleum products, they all threaten water quality, they threaten the life in the bays. Uh, you know, in the Peconic Basin, there's over 300 pipes that discharge in, into, the, into our waterways. Along the South Shore, there's probably thousands. They need to be mapped and they need to be systematically uh, dealt with. And it's incumbent upon, our, again, our, our local governments to deal with it. Um, we're releasing a report soon to come out on, on the state of our uh, sanitary systems. Basically, uh, Suffolk County sanitary code as it relates to uh, septic or cesspools. It's deficient. It may protect drinking water, but it's uh, grossly inadequate when it comes to protecting surface waters. The nitrogen level that emanates from uh, residential properties via uh, cesspools is too high. And it's, it's just a matter of time before uh, these individual creeks and tributaries uh, virtually collapse, as exemplified by the Forge River and Mastic Mauritius. If strong action, Kevin, isn't taken in soon, how do you see the future? My benchmark is based on my childhood, you know, in the late 70s and 80s, and what I knew these bays could produce. You know, again, this is visual in my own um, moment, my own use, recreational use of the bays. You know, catching fish, crabs, clams, etc. And you know, in the in the 30 years, I've, I've watched a, a major decline. Um, you know, something really has to be done. Uh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna bottom out here, and it's a sad day for Long Island when our waters can't you know basically support the life that you know historically we've known them to do. Uh, it's gonna affect us economically, spiritually, um, you know, emotionally. The list goes on. It's 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 a sad day if that if we come to that. But with that said, I am ultimately an optimist. I wouldn't be doing my work if I wasn't. Our waters are extremely resilient. So when we start controlling and eliminating what I refer to as the insults of the bay, you know, all the pollution problems from various sources, you know, they will rebound. We can, we can see these fish stocks recover. You know, I mentioned winter flounder earlier, a virtual collapse. You know, uh, I just wrote to the state of New York uh, asking them to close that fishery. Zero take, both on a recreational front as well as a uh, commercial front. If we don't, you know, stop the, uh, basically harvesting those fish, they have no hope of rebounding. And what really identifies us as much as hard clams and bay scallops, I mean, winter flounder on Long Island, that is a spring ritual for so many families. And, and we can't lose that. Long Island is representative of a national, indeed an international situation. A recent article in the noted British magazine, The Economist, the title, No More Fish in the Sea. This sort of ruination just has to stop. This has been a special report on WVVH-TV, Hamptons Television. I'm Carl Grossman. Thanks for watching.